My old self has been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. So I live in this earthly body by trusting in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. We're, we're currently in our sermon series on Galatians, uh, set free to live free. Um, and I've said it every week, we're set free by trusting in Jesus' work on the cross. And then we can live free by trusting in Jesus' work on our heart. So that's, that's the life-changing, that's the powerful, that's the good news, that's the only good news there is. Uh, so it's, it's, it's that, that trust is what saved us back when Jesus first got a hold of our hearts. It's that trust that saves us now in this present moment that we're trusting in the Lord. And that trust is what's going to save us on the day where we have to stand before God and give an account for our lives. Without that trust then, without that trust now, without that trust in the future, we don't got good news, right? That is the good news. From start to finish, in every moment in between, we need to be trusting in Jesus. Uh, how many of you made time to prepare your story uh, this week? How many of you were able to do that this week? All right, some of you, if you maybe some of you already had it prepared. Uh, if you didn't have a chance to prepare your story, uh, who you used to be, how Jesus got a hold of your life, what Jesus did for you, and, uh, and who you are now with Jesus, uh, that's the story that we're preparing. Because uh, if you don't prepare the story, then the likelihood of you actually sharing that story uh, becomes very small, right? We, or, or if we do share the story, we kind of fumble through it. Uh, we don't really remember all the details or, or we, we just kind of get mixed up in things. Uh, so, so make sure you prepare your story. Make sure you share your story. Um, if you don't prepare your story, it's going to be harder to share your story, okay? Uh, so be working on that again this week uh, if you haven't already. Um, this is week three in our series going through the book of Galatians. And today I want to answer this question for us. Uh, it's a very simple question. Uh, it's a very easy question. Uh, but it's a question I think that, that a lot of us don't actually think about intentionally. Uh, here's the question. How can I know that it's Jesus working through me and not just me working through my own strength and in my own efforts? Uh, how can I trust in Jesus to handle the conflict in my life? If everything I do apart from trusting in Jesus is just a wasted effort, how can I make sure, or what does it look like to trust in Jesus? Like actually, practically, how can I notice that I'm trusting Jesus in my life? Uh, there's this uh, story about a man who was walking out downtown, and he notices uh, two city workers on the other side of the street, and they're putting in a lot of work landscaping uh, this, on the sidewalks, and uh, this man's actually impressed by how hard these guys are working, because they're really giving it their all, they're putting in tons of effort, but at the same time, he couldn't exactly figure out what they were doing. He's like, he was just looking at it, and it seemed a little strange to him. Uh, he watched him for a while, trying to just make sense of it, and he decided to finally walk across the street and ask them, hey, what's going on? What are you doing? Uh, so he went up to the workers and said, he said, you guys are really working hard out here, but I just, I just don't understand what on earth you're doing. It seems like one of you is just digging a hole, and then the other one's coming back behind him and just filling in that hole. Like, what are you doing? What is the point of this? Well, one of the city workers puts down the shovel, looks at the man, and explains, yeah, the the third guy who actually plants the trees called off sick today. <laughs> Wasted work. <laughs> Wasted work, right? If we aren't daily inviting the third person of the Trinity to fill us up, if we're not telling Jesus, I trust in you, I'm trusting in you for the power, I need to live free, then we're going to spend most of our days digging ourselves into holes uh, or we're going to spend most of our days trying to fill back in those holes because our work is just going to be wasted. If we're not trusting in Jesus's power to do that work, then 
it does, it's meaningless. We're not going to bear any fruit. We're not going to see anything for our labor. Uh, so what does it look like to trust in Jesus? How can we tell that he's working through us and that our work isn't being wasted? We're going to look at three things today. Uh, this is a, as I, as I finish this sermon, it is more of a, a teaching sermon than it is a, a, a super preaching sermon, okay? There's a, I probably will get preachy anyway, but, uh, but there is going to be, we're going to look at some fine details of these verses that we go through, because uh, I want you to see today that Jesus' Jesus's work in our lives, it produces unity, it produces freedom, and it produces fruit. Jesus' work in our lives, it will produce unity, freedom, and fruit. So we're going to take a look at Galatians chapter 2. Uh, we're going to read verses 1 and 10 together. Please stand with me if you're able. It's going to be up on the screens. Let's read it out loud together. Here's what it says. It says this. Then 14 years later, I went back to Jerusalem again. This time with Barnabas and Titus came along too. I went there because God revealed to me that I should go. While I was there, I met privately with those considered to be leaders of the church and shared with them the message I'd been preaching to the Gentiles. I wanted to make sure that we were in agreement for fear that all my efforts had been wasted and I was running the race for nothing. And they supported me and did not even demand that my companion Titus be circumcised, though he was a Gentile. Even that question came up only because of some so-called believers there, false ones really, who were secretly brought in. They sneaked in to spy on us and take away the freedom we have in Christ Jesus. They wanted to enslave us, and force us to follow their Jewish regulations. But we refused to give in to them for a single moment. We wanted to preserve the truth of the gospel message for you. And the leaders of the church had nothing to add to what I was preaching. By the way, their reputation as great leaders made no difference to me, for God has no favorites. Instead, they saw that God had given me the responsibility of preaching the gospel to the Gentiles, just as he had given Peter the responsibility of preaching to the Jews. For the same God who worked through Peter as the apostle to the Jews also worked through me as the apostle to the Gentiles. In fact, James, Peter, and John, who were known as pillars of the church, Recognize the gift God had given me, and they accepted Barnabas and me as their co-workers. They encouraged us to keep preaching to the Gentiles while they continued their work with the Jews. Their only suggestion was that we keep on helping the poor, which I have always been eager to do. You can have a seat. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for your words to us this morning. And as we look at Paul's visit to the church in Jerusalem, we just ask that you help us to learn from his experience. Show us the unity and freedom and fruit that you want to produce in our lives. We invite you, Holy Spirit, to work in us and through us as we apply the truth of your word this morning. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So before we dive in, to the actual text, we got to remember the context, right? Uh, the context of what we're looking at. So I'm just going to do a little recap for you. Uh, sometime after Paul had established the churches in Galatia, uh, behind him came these Jewish Christians who had come to the churches, and they started talking about how, hey, everything that Paul said, uh, he was missing a few things. Uh, he's not really a good apostle anyway. Um, if you're not Jewish, uh, which... The people in the churches of Galatia were not Jewish. If you're not Jewish, you need to become Jewish to truly follow Jesus. That was their message. And I do want to clarify that it's not bad to be a Jewish Christian. All right? That in and of itself is not bad. All the disciples were Jewish Christians. Uh, uh, Paul was a Jewish Christian um, himself. And, and what was bad, that there was a specific group 
of Jewish Christians that were going around telling people that they needed to meet some extra requirements other than just trusting in Jesus to follow Jesus. That was the bad thing, okay? Uh, and in order to convince the Galatians of this, uh, they, were, they were using some less than ethical methods. So they're dragging Paul's name through the mud uh, in order to convince the Galatians that, hey, our message is better than Paul's. They, they had to badmouth the gospel that Paul preached, and they had to try to destroy his credibility as an apostle. So that was, that was what they had to do in order to convince the Galatians, hey, come over to our side, join us. So the book of Galatians is Paul's defense of both the ministry that he had as an apostle and the message that he preached about the good news of Jesus. Those were the two things that Paul's trying to defend here. And if you've missed the past two weeks, uh, he's done a pretty good job at defending those two things, right? Uh, he spent all of chapter one making a persuasive, uh, a persuasive argument and case that his apostleship and his gospel came uh, to him, not from Jerusalem or from someone else. He didn't make it up, uh, but it was a direct revelation from Jesus. Uh, and that means that he wasn't taught the good news of Jesus by any man. Uh, it wasn't just some idea that he made up in his head. He had an actual, real, personal encounter with Jesus, and he spent years preaching about it and sharing his story with people. That's where we're at so far. So Paul's made some really good points about his message. Uh, hopefully, he's starting to gain back some of that credibility that he'd lost with the Galatians. Um, but now there's an issue. There's a problem that these Galatians are going to have. Uh, the Galatians are now questioning, okay, if Paul is good in our minds now, if he is an apostle, if his message is directly from Jesus, what do the other apostles think about that message? Because, because the Jewish Christians supposedly were sent by them to the Galatians, right? So if these Jewish Christians are sent to them by the Galatians, and they're preaching a different message than Paul, if, uh, if they're questioning Paul's uh, apostleship, then now that Paul has, has kind of proven his case, well, what, what do the other apostles think about Paul? What do, what do, they, what do they think about his message? Uh, are, it could be kind of confusing to them, right? Are there two messages that are okay to preach? Like, what, what's going on here? So Paul res responds to this by sharing a story from his time in Jerusalem with the other apostles. Uh, and the first thing we're going to see, you can write this down. How can we tell that Jesus is working through us? Uh, what does it look like to trust in Jesus? Here it is. If we're trusting in Jesus, we will actively pursue unity. If we're trusting in Jesus, we will actively pursue unity. So we're going to see Paul actively pursuing unity between him and the other apostles. And he's going to show us how we can do the same thing. So we're going to dissect verses uh, 1 through 3 a little bit. Um, so we're going to do a lot of stopping and explaining, okay? Uh, so look at, this is the three ways that Paul actively pursues unity with the other apostles. Uh, here's what he writes. He says, then 14 years later, I went back to Jerusalem again. So, so we're going to stop right there. I want us to remember that three years after Jesus got a hold of, of, uh, of Paul's heart, uh, he said he did something. What was that? He went to Jerusalem, right? Three years after. Three years of preaching uh, the gospel message. Three years of sharing his story. He was like, hey, I'm going to go meet some of these other apostles. Not to learn from them. Not to be trained by them. He's just going to go meet them. Well, well, here's 14 years later. And Paul is going back again to Jerusalem. And uh, he, he doesn't go back until 14 years later from that time. And, and when he does, his goal is to pursue unity. Uh, let's come to an agreement on the requirements for Gentiles to become Jesus followers. Because I've been preaching this message for 14 years, and we need to have some agreement on what that looks like. So look at the first thing that Paul mentions. He actively pursues unity by bringing others with him. Two others, to be exact. He says, I went back to Jerusalem again, this time with Barnabas. Why Barnabas? Why that person? Well, for a few reasons, because it wasn't just like, oh, this is my best friend. I'm going to bring him along with me. He actually had a reason for bringing Barnabas along. Uh, Barnabas was well known and respected in the Jewish community. So people who might not listen to Paul, who 
wasn't as well known and wasn't as respected just because of his past, right? Uh, might not have listened to Paul. Uh, they might listen to Barnabas or Barnabas might give him an in. But also Barnabas is known for actually having his own conflicts with Paul. Does that, does anyone remember those things, right? So, so he's actually had his own conflicts with Paul. He wasn't a yes man. And Paul needed someone who was going to challenge him and push back if needed. Hey, Barnabas, if I step out of line while I'm talking to these other apostles, if I say something that's not necessarily true, uh, let me know. Jump on in. Push back. Uh, I need challenged. I, I respect you and your walk with Jesus, and I need that from you. So also, uh, Barnabas had a good track record. His his actual name uh, is, is uh, he's called Barnabas by Paul because that means the encourager. And so he, he has this encouraging, this peacemaking, this mediating personality. Paul wanted to bring along a third party to help keep the peace. So that was why Barnabas. Um, but then the verse says, and Titus came along too. Titus came along too. Why Titus? Well, it was mostly because Paul wanted to show him off. Hey, look at this guy, uh, because this was one of the first Gentiles that Paul introduced to Jesus. One of the first ones. He was converted early on in Paul's ministry. He was one of Paul's friends, and Paul needed to break some Gentile stereotypes going into Jerusalem, okay? Uh, Titus was the guy, he, he had the character to break those Gentile stereotypes. So for so long, like for the longest time, uh, Gentiles were seen as enemies of the Jewish people. And there were probably a lot of racist assumptions that they had about Gentiles that just weren't true. Um, now, Paul could point to Titus and say, hey, look, this spirit-filled Gentile, look at him. He's loving. He's patient. He's bringing peace. He's joyful. He's displaying all the characteristics of a, of a spirit-filled life, just like you guys are. He's just like you. He's different, but at the same time, he's just as spirit-filled. He's just as much of a Jesus follower as you guys. So that's why he brought Titus along. So when actively pursuing unity in any situation, we need to invite others into the conflict who are going to help, not harm. Who are going to help, not harm. What's that look like? Well, that looks like people who are going to give us good counsel. That looks like not just, uh, not just bringing along people who are going to tell us what we want to hear and confirm our biases and confirm the things that we're going to say. It's actual people who you want to pursue unity. If you want to pursue unity, you bring people along with you who also want that, not who also just want to confirm what you're saying and have it your way. Right? So, so we need to bring those kind of people, uh, people who are good encouragers and peacemakers and mediators, people who can empathize and relate and represent both sides of the conflict. Uh, Titus was, was the representative for the Gentiles in that moment, right? He was, he, was being, he was able to relate to what they've been going through. He's able to relate to how the message the apostles preach and the message that, that, that Paul preaches, how it actually affects Gentile ears. And so, so you bring people along who are able to empathize and relate and represent um, and whose primary goal is unity. Actively pursue unity. So that's the first thing. Uh, Paul brings others with him. We see uh, Paul actively pursuing unity in a second way, and it's by waiting to hear from the Lord. Waiting to hear from the Lord. Look at why Paul went back to Jerusalem. Here's what it says. This is why he went back. I went there because God revealed to me that I should go. I went there because God revealed to me that I should go. Paul didn't go because he wanted to prove something. Hey, you know what? My message is working. Take a look at Titus. Like, that's not what he wanted to do. He didn't go because he wanted to prove something. He didn't go because the Jewish apostles said, man, that Paul guy is preaching some weird message. He better come, you know, we're going to correct him and rebuke him and train him. Uh, that's not why he's going. Uh, the decision wasn't an emotional decision for Paul. And get this, the emotion wasn't a logical decision for Paul. Uh, now, I'm sure he had emotion and logic tied up into the decision, but his ultimate decision, the reason why he went, is because he was waiting for the Lord to reveal to him when he should go. And when the Lord did, he went. I'd say this is a missed step for a lot of us. Uh, we don't, we just don't always take the time to bring Jesus into our decisions. There's so many decisions to make in life, and we just, 
We just make them like, because that's the easy thing to do, right? And, it, and if we're doing the easy thing, uh, especially when it comes to conflict, we either do one of two things. Well, we uh, either immediately take action, right? Or we don't ever take action. Those are usually the two things that we do uh, in conflict, right? So instead of bringing Jesus in and, and asking when, when we should go, we do whatever's more comfortable for us. Some of us are, are more that, uh, that go get them fight personality that, that's like, hey, I'm going to go handle this right now. Others of us are more of like a, a flight personality, like, ah, I hate conflict. I don't want to do that. I want to avoid that at all costs. I'm out here. So that's, that's our go-tos usually uh, if we're not seeking Jesus and not asking him uh, how he wants us to handle the situation. Paul's clear that when we're trusting in Jesus, when we're actively pursuing unity, it's important that we're praying and asking the Lord to reveal to us when to move. And here's something to, to think about. And uh, it's something that I was asking myself as I'm, as I'm going through this passage was like, how many conflicts in my life have been escalated or have never been dealt with because instead of taking the issue to God and waiting for him to guide me, I just did whatever I felt comfortable doing. I would say probably a lot of them. So Paul actively pursues unity by bringing others with him, by waiting to hear from the Lord. And finally, uh, by finding common ground with those he wanted to come to an agreement with. He finds common ground. Uh, let's finish verses 2 and 3. Paul writes this. While I was there, I met privately with those considered to be leaders of the church and shared with them the message I had been preaching to the Gentiles. I wanted to make sure that we were in agreement for fear that all my efforts had been wasted and I was running the race for nothing. And they supported me and did not even demand that my companion Titus be circumcised, though he was a Gentile. When Paul got to Jerusalem... First thing I noticed, he didn't make a big fuss. He didn't cause a scene. He didn't call for a riot, right? He didn't create problems. He met with the leaders privately. He met with the people that he was, have, he was concerned that they weren't going to agree. He met with them privately. And he shared his story with them. He's like, hey guys, here's, here's what I'm preaching. Here's my message. Here's, here's who I was. Here's what Jesus did for me. And here's who I am now. And here's the message I'm preaching now. And, and they supported him. They saw Jesus working through him and his companions, and they were, they were hearing the same message from the Lord that Paul was hearing. And they found common ground in their relationship with Jesus, which goes beyond race. It goes beyond religious activity. So what does it look like to trust in Jesus? Well, if we're trusting in Jesus, we will actively pursue unity by bringing other people along. We're going to actively uh, pursue unity by waiting to hear from the Lord. And then we're going to actively pursue unity by finding common ground with people. Here's the second thing. If we're trusting in Jesus, we will live free. Uh, in verses 4 through 5, Paul writes this. He says, even that question came up. Well, what question? Well, look back at verse 3. The question about whether Gentiles should be circumcised. Uh, whether Gentiles should have to become Jewish to follow Jesus, that question, Paul says it came up only because of some so-called believers there. False ones, really, who were brought in. They sneaked in to spy on us and take away the freedom we have in Christ Jesus. They wanted to enslave us and force us to follow their Jewish regulations. But we refused to give in to them. Again, we refused to give in to them for a single moment. And we wanted to preserve the truth of the gospel message for you. This is kind of a funny little section because I want you to note like, Did you notice that the same experience that Paul's currently going through with the Galatians, like in this present moment through this letter, was the same exact experience that Paul had to go with, through with the Church of Jerusalem? That's like he's explaining the same exact situation. Hey, this isn't anything new. This is something that we've handled before. Uh, the same exact experience of having these Jewish Christians who are preaching this false gospel, this false message. They came into the church of Jerusalem. Uh, this is just a same situation, different place kind of situation. Um, so, so Paul, uh, in both cases, are saying they're, they're false believers. They're preaching a false message. They're preaching a false gospel. And uh, here's, what, here's what we did about it then. And here's what I want you to do about it now. 
So this is, he's telling them, hey, this is what we did about it then. Here's what you need to do about it now. Um, Paul's wanting to encourage the Galatians to, to do what he and the other Jewish apostles did in this situation. And here's what they did. They refused to give in for a single moment to this false gospel. And they preserved the truth of the true gospel message. Refuse to give in, preserve the truth. And that is the recipe for anyone who's trusting in Jesus to live free. That is the recipe of living free. In Ephesians chapter 4, verses 21 through 24, Paul says it this way. He says, since you have heard about Jesus and have learned the truth that comes from him, here's what you're going to do. You're going to refuse to give in for a single moment. Or throw off your old sinful nature and your former way of life, which is corrupted by lust and deception. And instead, you're going to preserve the truth of the gospel message by letting the Spirit renew your thoughts and attitudes, put on your new nature, created to be like God, truly righteous and holy. Refuse to give in, preserve the truth. So, how does, what does that look like practically? Well, if you find yourself, I don't know, if you find yourself in need of telling a lie, right? It's very tempting. You know, I need to lie to get it out of the situation. You showed up late to work and your boss might fire you. Well, let's go with that. If, let's say, you show up to work, uh, you need to refuse to give in to that lie, right? We, uh, we all know that part. Uh, avoid the temptation. Don't give in. Don't do the lie, right? That's the easy part. But you need to preserve the truth of the gospel message that you don't have to lie to be a to, to make yourself look good. You don't have to do that anymore. You don't have to lie to protect yourself because you're already accepted and you're already protected by God and you might get fired. I don't know, but it's not worth the lie. And no matter what happens, he's got your back. He's there with you. No matter what happens, you're accepted and protected through him. That's the truth of the gospel message. So you don't have to give in to that temptation to lie. Uh, another scenario, if you're feeling tempted maybe to leave your spouse because you feel unhappy or unloved or uncared for, refuse to give in to that. Preserve the truth of the gospel message that Jesus loved you so much that he gave his life for you. He can make up for any shortage of love that you're hoping to feel from your spouse. In fact, any happiness you're looking for outside of him will always fail. But he'll always be there to care for you in the pain and suffering that you're living in. That's how you preserve the gospel truth. And refuse to give in to the lie. Uh, if you're tempted to worry and live in fear because of the uncertainty of the future... Will we go to war? Will the economy collapse? What if so-and-so wins the next election? Whatever it is, refuse to give in and preserve the truth of the gospel, which in that case would be, look, the Lord's the ruler of the universe anyway. He's in charge of all of that anyway. He knows who's going to get elected next. He knows when we're going to go into wartime situations. He knows all those things. And no matter how things shake down, he's in control of your future. Refuse to give in to anything or anyone who wants to take away from the value and completeness of what Jesus did on the cross. And refuse to give in to anything or anyone who wants to try and add our effort and our ability to what Jesus is doing. And then preserve the truth of the gospel message by trusting in Jesus and letting that be enough. It all comes back to trusting in Jesus. Every temptation, every difficulty, every obstacle is just a chance for us to trust Jesus. It's just a chance for us to trust. Even giving into the temptation. Let's say you, you lied. Or let's say you left. Or let's say you are in a bunch of fear and worry. Even that's an opportunity to trust. Even that's an opportunity to trust that we can run to Jesus. We can confess those things. And he will forgive us and he will cleanse us. We trust that we can fill up daily with the spirit. And we trust that we can overcome it next time. So what does it look like to trust in Jesus? If we're trusting in Jesus, we will actively pursue unity. We will live free. And the last thing I want to talk about today, if we're trusting in Jesus, we will produce fruit. If we're trusting in Jesus, we will produce fruit. Paul finishes up this section in verses 6 through 10. And we're going to see, uh, we're going to see three areas that we can focus on that, uh, that will produce the best kind of fruit. Uh, he's going to give us three areas. If you want to produce fruit in your life, focus on these three areas, okay? Here's what Paul says. Area number one is mission. Area number one is mission. Paul starts out saying, he says, the leaders of the church had nothing to add to what I was preaching. By the way, and he throws in this little side note. By the way, 
Their reputation as great leaders made no difference to me, for God has no favorites. Instead, they saw that God had given me the responsibility of preaching the gospel to the Gentiles, just as he had given Peter the responsibility of preaching to the Jews. For the same God who worked through Peter as the apostle to the Jews also worked through me as an apostle to the Gentiles. When it says that the leaders of the church had nothing to add onto what Paul was saying. They had nothing to add onto what he was preaching. It means that Paul didn't leave anything out. What Paul was preaching was the full gospel message. He didn't leave anything out. He wasn't trying to add anything to make his message more appealing to the Gentiles. Uh, I mean, it could, it could sound like that, right? Hey, you're Gentile. That means you're not Jewish. That means you don't have to follow those rules. Like, that could sound like it'd make it more appealing to them, but he didn't add. He, his, his message was perfect. That's not what he was highlighting. What he was highlighting was the grace and the trust in Jesus that was needed for them to follow him. And so, so when it says they didn't add anything, it means he didn't leave anything out. Paul stayed focused on the mission. He stayed focused on the mission, and he let that inform the method of how he was reaching the Gentiles. It didn't matter that the Gentile Christians did things differently than the Jewish Christians. What mattered was that they were all united in carrying out the same mission. It didn't matter that the way God was working through Peter, who had the responsibility of preaching to the Jews, who was different than the way God was working through Paul, who had the responsibility of preaching to the Gentiles. What mattered was that it was the same God who was working through both Peter and Paul to accomplish the same mission. Look, Jesus is a, I don't know if you know this or not, but he's going to work differently through our church than he is through other churches. And that's okay. We're going to do different things. Uh, we have a CARES program. Another church might have a food pantry. Who cares? That's what he's doing through us. That's what he's doing through them. We've listened to the Holy Spirit. We feel like this is what he wants us to do. They've listened to the Holy Spirit. They feel like that's what they want them to do, right? Like uh, the Nazarene church down the road, uh, they do church differently than we do, but we're all on the same team. We're all united in mission. We're all united in mission to reach people with the message of Jesus and make disciples. So it doesn't matter how different they do things. It doesn't matter how different we do things. You can't get caught up on the method. You always need to stay focused on the mission. If you get caught up on the method, you're going to keep doing that same method over and over. And it might be producing fruit now, but it might not produce fruit later. And then you're just going to have no fruit, right? Got to stay focused on the mission and got to be willing to change the methods and uh, to not judge the methods of other people. We can't let how we carry out that mission take priority over the mission. Area number two we can stay focused on that's going to produce the best fruit is gifts. Gifts. Paul says, in fact, James, Peter, and John, who were known as pillars of the church, recognized the gift God had given me. And they accepted Barnabas and me as their co-workers, they encouraged us to keep preaching to the Gentiles while they continued their work with the Jews. Look, we've all been gifted in different ways. And you want to focus in the way that you've been gifted. You want to you grow in that gift. You want to find out what that gift is. And if you are working in that gift, if, you're, if you keep on doing that gift, like they were keeping on preaching, it's going to produce fruit in your life. James, Peter, and John recognized the u unique gifts that Paul and Barnabas had been given, and then he, they encouraged them to keep using those gifts. Uh, we've all been given a specific gift from God that we were meant to use, and if we're, not, if we're not using that Holy Spirit gift, then we're not trusting in Jesus like we should be, and we're missing out on producing some really good fruit. So find out your gift. Use your gift. Area number three is giving. Paul writes, their only suggestion was that we keep on helping the poor, which I've always been eager to do. Their only suggestion. Hey guys, just keep also, you know, while you're doing all that other stuff you're doing, while you're preaching that gospel to the Gentiles, we just suggest that you keep on helping the poor as well. Don't ever stop doing that. And I want you to see something here, because some translations say, remember the poor. I don't know if you have a translation that you're looking at that says, remember the poor. Uh, this translation in, in the NLT says, helping the poor. But the Greek word, and I might botch this completely, because this is a tough one. 
It's like Mene Menuo. Mene Menuo is how it's pronounced, right? Uh, it literally means to think of and feel for the poor. To think of and feel for the poor. You're giving space in your mind and you're giving space in your emotions for them. And that's the primary thing, uh, the, the primary thing that this led the apostles to do. So the apostles, they thought about the poor, they felt for the poor. And the primary thing that this led them to do was to give financially to those in need. But I don't think that it's a stretch to say that this could also include giving of your time and giving of your energy. Uh, we're putting ourselves in a position to trust when we give. Of no matter what we're giving. If we're giving financially, we're saying, Lord, I trust that this money that you actually gave me to steward, uh, I trust that, uh, that you're going to provide for me no matter how I spend it or no matter how I give it. If you're giving of your energy, you're saying, Lord, I, I trust in you that while right now I feel like everything's just an inconvenience and I don't want to be here, but I trust that this energy that I'm giving you, that, it, that it's, it's actually going to produce fruit. It's actually going to make a difference in the world. Uh, uh, Lord, uh, I don't have much time, but, uh, but here's the time I do have. And I could be spending it sitting on the couch watching Netflix, but I'm going to actually trust in you that, uh, that instead of watching Netflix on TV, that, that I'm spending my time in a way that's going to actually help and going to actually produce fruit and going to actually uh, help, help the poor, help, help the people who are in need. Uh, people can be poor financially. People can be poor spiritually. People can be poor in a lot of different ways, right? Uh, we need to be giving of our time, of our energy, of our resources. Uh, and, and when you do that, you will produce some fruit. So mission, gifts, and giving are three areas we can focus on that's going to produce the best fruit in our lives. And every single one of those areas challenges us to trust in Jesus. If we're trusting in Jesus, we will actively pursue unity by surrounding ourselves with others that pursue unity, by waiting to move until we hear from the Lord, uh, by finding common ground in our relationships with Jesus. We're going to live free by refusing to give in to the lies that want to enslave us and by constantly going back to the truth of the gospel. And we're going to produce fruit by focusing on mission over anything, by using our gifts, and by giving of our time, resources, and energy. So are you trusting in Jesus? Can you point to areas in your life where you see unity happening? Can you point to areas in your life where you see freedom happening? Can you point to areas in your life where you can see yourself producing fruit? If you can't, it might be a sign that you're not trusting in Jesus like you should be. It, it, that's, that is the sign. Uh, so, so my encouragement to you will be start trusting in Jesus. Start moving in those areas. Start actively pursuing that unity. Start living free and start producing fruit.